Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. You are attending the DBRS Morningstar U.S. Middle Market CLO 101 webinar. My name is Stephanie Ma. I am a researcher in our Structured Finance Group, where I focus on ABS and structured credit. I will be interviewing my colleague, Jerry Van Kulbergen, who is a Managing Director and Head of Structured Credit here at DBRS Morningstar. Jerry, if you would please introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Stephanie. So um, my name is Jerry, Jerry Van Kulbergen. Um, I have been responsible for the structured credit team at DBRS for about 13 years. Um, that's the lead um, analytical team. So we're assigning and monitoring ratings and maintaining the methodologies. Um, and uh, welcome to our uh, 101 webinar, Middle Market CLOs. Middle Market CLOs are an important CLO subclass, sub-asset class. So um, I think this should be an interesting topic for us to work through and discuss together. Uh, and DBRS has been rating middle market CLO since about 2009. So we have a long track record in the asset class. Um, with that, maybe Stephanie, I'll turn it back to you. Fantastic. First, we'll start off with a broad overview of the US CLO market in 2021, providing information on issuance trends with a focus on the middle market segment. Next, we'll turn our attention to providing a primer on middle market CLOs, starting off with the basics and then delving into more nuanced items that are important to, for investors to know. A couple housekeeping items first. Please feel free to type in any questions that you may have throughout the presentation. You should see a question mark either on the right side or bottom side of your pa panel. We will address your questions at the end of the webinar. Let's get started. U.S. CLO issuance has been ro very robust this year, with new issuance year date through the first week of November totaling about $150 billion, double the amount that we saw in the same period last year. Admittedly, middle market comprises a smaller portion of overall CLO issuance, with broadly syndicated loans, or BSLs, dominating volume. U.S. middle market CLO issuance totaled around $15 billion year to date, and that's about, I would say, 10% of overall CLO issuance. And that spans across 27 deals. For comparison, same period last year, we saw 8 billion and 19 deals. Jerry, with that in mind, what are the key drivers behind the growth that we've seen in middle market CLOs? Yeah, sure. So I think the, the primary drivers for the increase in uh, middle market CLO issuance are low interest rates, stable credit fundamentals, um, strong private equity activity, and strong interest in private credit. So all of these factors kind of tie in with one another, kind of driving interest and activity in uh, increasing private credit assets under management and uh, leveraging private credit through CLOs. I think each of these dynamics has resulted in a, a slightly different profile of middle market CLOs for this year. I think in addition to seeing just more CLOs, so we've seen a, um, a larger number of CLOs, the CLOs that have been issued and syndicated to investors um, are larger too. And I think that that's uh, really a result of this, uh, again, strong interest in private credit driven by the higher yields that are attainable there and the stable credit fundamentals we've actually seen through the, the COVID-19 crisis last year. And you mentioned COVID. So throughout the pandemic, a lot of focus has been on credit and potential deterioration given the initial pullback in economic activity. Jerry, were you surprised with how resilient middle market CLOs have proven to be throughout the pandemic to date? And what were the main contributing factors behind this performance? Yeah, sure. So um, middle market credits tend to be um, a bit more bespoke and they tend to potentially be a bit more levered. So it is surprising to me that the middle market loans uh, performed as well as they, they did. Um, I think one of the reasons that they did are the intense relationships that lenders and borrowers have in this industry. So I think that that tends to result in um, sort of a greater awareness of where issues might be popping up within companies. So I think that borrower and lender relationship is important. And secondly, I think the um, the interest in private equity and private credit has driven a, a, a tremendous amount of dry powder and investment uh, interest in this area. So that left um, both owners 
in terms of the equity side and lenders on the debt side uh, with uh, ammunition to be uh, supporting companies that deserve support during COVID. Great. Now, having covered the, the current state of the CLO market, perhaps we could take a, a few steps back now and start at the, kind of the, the very basic level, the definition of middle market CLO. Quite simply, it's an actively managed securitized portfolio of bank loans made to highly leveraged medium-sized companies, typically with earnings less than 100 million. Jerry, maybe you could expand on that and discuss how middle market CLOs are used and the motivation behind them. Yeah, sure. I think the middle market CLOs come in, um, you know, are, they really have two different purposes. Uh, the first is a funding source. So uh, they provide leverage for uh, private debt funds and business development companies or BDCs. Um, uh, or they are um, asset management vehicles. So they're a way for managers to increase assets under management. Um, I think the, the preponderance of syndicated middle market CLOs tend to fall into the, the funding source category. Uh, so that means that these funds themselves are ultimately holding the, the equity. Uh, but there is some, uh, albeit small, liquidity in the uh, in middle market CLO equity, which kind of drives the, uh, the asset management vehicle side. Um, and Stephanie, as I'm kind of um, thinking about this, um, just as an additional kind of point to the um, to the COVID performance, I wanted to talk maybe a little bit about uh, maybe before we get into the fundamentals, um, some of the actual numbers around the resiliency of middle market CLOs. So, um, it, is that okay? Is that does that make oh, sense? Oh, no, no, sure. I think I think that would provide the the audience with some good perspective. Okay, great. Yeah. So, in terms of um, sort of, I'll talk a little bit about downgrade exposure to non-performing loans and par loss uh, here for just a moment. So in 2020, we saw about 3% um, of our issuers downgraded, uh, representing about maybe 1.5% of our ratings that were downgraded. Um, so this is a, you know, a relatively good performance given the stress. Um, we've seen, like I mentioned before, some of that support in the terms of uh, lenders and private equity were kind of key there to keep those downgrades from uh, growing or uh, eventually morphing into losses. And frankly, where we saw those downgrades, they tended to be in transactions that were um, either uh, more static or drifting towards being more static. So out of their uh, out of their reinvestment period or were structured to be static. And those types of transactions tend to have maybe a little bit less cushion than might be available in transactions that have ongoing uh, revolving portfolio capacity that they need to service. So this compares like our DBRS downgrade percentages kind of compare with the broad CLO market um, in this way that about 12% of BSL CLOs uh, were, were downgraded. So it's a, a much smaller percentage. Uh, the exposure to, to non-performing loans that in our deals is about maybe two, 3% in our, our estimate. And we saw no par losses in 2020. So um, that's also maybe a bit uh, different than uh, BSL CLOs, where there is greater liquidity in the underlying assets. So within BSL CLOs, um, there were asset sales that were aimed to de-risk the portfolios um, during COVID. Um, that tends to be less of an opportunity for middle market CLOs. But still, as a result, we saw no par losses in, um, in 2020. Thanks, Stephanie. Okay. Oh, thanks for sharing that. I think that's very interesting. Maybe you could just kind of summarize kind of the, the next few areas that we'll cover next, Jerry. Yeah, yeah, sure. So the, the next couple of topics, we're going to talk about the underlying um, asset composition in middle market CLOs. Uh, then we're going to talk a bit about the structure for middle market CLOs. Uh, and then lastly, we're going to go into some of the kind of key differences for investors uh, between uh, middle market CLOs and, and BSL CLOs. So um, kind of a, a broad conversation arc there. Well, as you said, we're going to turn our attention next to, to asset composition. Looking at specific features of the underlying assets of middle market CLOs, you mentioned earlier a little bit, you know, given that relationship, that, that close relationship between borrowers and lenders, Jerry, could you please expand on the dynamics that DBRS Morningstar is seeing on that end? Yeah, sure. So, the with smaller borrowers, there tends to be a much closer relationship between the borrower and the the lender. So um, the borrowers themselves tend to come in um, two general broad general categories in terms of company ownership. Uh, the first is 
private equity sponsored, and then the second is non-private equity sponsored. So in the sponsored uh, sponsored equity transactions, uh, typically the equity is owned by private equity funds. Uh, and the private equity fund managers have established business models for um, uh, leverage programs that they seek for their underlying assets. So working with sponsors means you're working with um, a larger company that has uh, repeat funding needs and, and other kind of relationship potentials to be uh, establishing so that there's um, either future origination opportunities um, or um, a common company across uh, multiple uh, or a common uh, negotiating partner across multiple companies that one could interact with if there are issues uh, with a borrower. In terms of the, the lenders, lenders, the, the lending market for middle market used to be a bank lending market. Now it's largely uh, non-bank lenders. And so those non-bank lenders tend to be um, either uh, private debt fund managers, um, business development companies, um, or, or other uh, specialty finance companies. And they lend either directly to the borrowers, so that means there's one lender, uh, or they're doing it in small syndicates of lenders. So in the direct lending example, there's a single lender who really is driving the, the economics, the terms uh, that's you know, underlying the, the, the credit. And then in club uh, lending, there's a small syndicate of, of investors. And while there might be one lead agent who might be you know, leading the, the documents, the economics of the credit, uh, there's typically a, 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 the, the group the syndicate that's typically working together um, are lenders who are used to working together. And so they form a, a partnership that could be repeatable across uh, multiple types of, uh, of borrowing opportunities. And what about on the, the underlying assets? What types of loans do you typically see and how does DBRS Morningstar measure credit quality? Yeah, sure. So mostly in uh, middle market CLOs, there are senior secured loans and they tend to be covenant heavy versus covenant light. So that means that the, you know, the documents and the, the credit is typically very highly negotiated the lenders themselves are with covenants very actively involved in the, the business. So that can mean that they are um, participating in the board. Uh, they have closer monitoring relationships with the underlying borrowers, uh, but they're, uh, they're interacting in a sort of a, a much more uh, organic and interactive way than you might find uh, with larger borrowers, with uh, larger borrowers, with many, many, many lenders. Um, so it's less often that we see uh, covenant light loans in the middle market space. We might see covenant light and some of the larger borrowers and some who have larger borrowing needs where there actually tends to be either larger club syndications or, or an actual syndication of the debt. Uh, but largely we're seeing those covenants which kind of drive this uh, intense relationship, which can be quite useful when the company um, or if a company starts to uh, experience uh, deterioration. The, the trade-off there obviously is with that level of interaction, the, the loans are uh, less liquid because when you're, when you're selling those loans or if you're uh, participating in those loans with other lenders, that relationship needs to move along with that loan. Um, and those are, could be a bit more challenging to, uh, to transfer. The, um, the credit quality for the loans themselves um, tends to be lower than you might see in the BSL space. Um, there are fewer ratings with smaller borrowers, not surprisingly. Um, they usually don't have the same requirement for ratings because they're not syndicating their loans as broadly. Um, there tends to be credit estimates then that rating agencies and investors look for when there aren't publicly available indications of default probabilities. And that's sort of its own, um, that's sort of its own thing within the middle market space that kind of is unique. Because credit estimates, um, reflect the credit quality of the borrowers differently than uh, than ratings. Uh, they're, they're not ratings themselves. Um, they're just estimates of a issuer's likelihood of default. Uh, they tend to be point in time. They tend to be model based. So um, and they tend to um, not be as public as uh, as ratings. So credit estimates, like for example, DBRS will allow a lender to 
show in their trustee report what credit estimates are, but credit estimates aren't sort of readily available like you might find public ratings on a you know on the DBRS website. Great. Now, if we look at uh, tackle structure next, yeah. if we look at slide six, there are a lot of different moving parts on this slide. Jerry, maybe you could walk us through the components that we see here covering the typical structure of a silo. I think the audience would find that very helpful. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So this graphic has um, has a, a, a at, at, at its extremes uh, on this on the ends, it's got the a corporate and the silo capital structure, and that's intended to reflect that there are similarities between how corporates fund themselves and how a securitization like a CLO might fund itself. And these things are orbiting around um, in the center, the CLO structure itself with its key counterparties and what that really is. So on the asset side on the left, you've got, uh, you, got you have elements of the corporate structure that are being put into the CLO. And on the right, you have the essentially the, uh, you know, the balance sheet for a, uh, for a CLO. So within the corporate capital structure, there is a priority of payment of principal and bankruptcy, and there's also a priority of payment for interest. And that priority of payment uh, in those situations uh, drives the uh, both the uh, it drives in total, given all of the different elements, it drives the default probability of the underlying borrower. And then the seniority itself of each individual element drives the likelihood of expected loss. So a senior secured loan is the, going to have the same default probability as any other instrument in the capital structure because they are all tied to the same issuer, uh, but they will have a different outcome in terms of expected loss in a bankruptcy because there is a prioritization of how um, uh, recoveries are distributed. A CLO has a similar prioritization structure, but it's a bit more technical and it's a bit more very clearly defined in the indentures that drive the issuance for uh, for CLOs. So it, within CLOs, there's a very clear cash flow waterfall. So those waterfalls pay principal and interest as they are received on the portfolio of underlying senior secured loans. Uh, they pay the senior class first and the mezzanine class second and the subordinated class third. Um, it is in the event of a uh, in the event of an issue with the underlying CLO, the for example, an event of default, uh, prioritization still remains the same. The senior class gets paid first and the subordinated get, class gets paid um, later. And because of that prioritization, it's very specific defined prioritization within the documents, the senior classes are able to obtain a higher rating than the mezzanine or maybe the more subordinated uh, tranches within that CLO. So kind of in summary from the asset and liability side, both the underlying borrowers and the CLO itself have a prioritization in terms of how they are repaid. And that's key to the credit risk in each of those uh, various instruments. And Jerry, if we expand on that, and if we look at the, the left side and the right side that you referenced, can you touch upon the, the risk characteristics on not only the corporate capital structure, but also on the bond side as well? So looking at the various tranche levels. Yeah, yeah, sure. So the in, in corporate analysis, the um, because the corporate instruments on the left side are all tied to a single um, corporate in terms of its likelihood of default uh, or not defaulting, the rating for each of those interest instruments starts with what the issuer's default probability is, and then there could be an, a notched adjustment based on the priority within the corporate capital structure. So, for example, for a very well-protected senior secured loan, its instrument level rating would never really be more than three notches above where the uh, where the issuer rating is. That's because it's all tied to the performance of a single issuer. Within the CLO, there's a portfolio of issuers. So it, it with the portfolio uh, of issuers and the prioritization of the payment of principal and interest that's very clearly defined, you can actually have relatively wide disparities in the senior mezzanine and subordinate if it exists. 
uh, tranches for uh, CLO. So often in syndicated CLOs, the senior class will be triple A. Mezzanine tranches might be single A or triple uh, triple B, and subordinated mezzanines might be down to you know occasionally double B. And what are some unique features that you're seeing in CLO transactions generally? Yeah, yeah, sure. I think the unique features within CLOs that kind of make a CLO a CLO are, are, are twofold. It's the fact that the portfolios are changing over time. So that's a lens uh, of analysis that um, for investors is different than maybe other uh, structured finance um, asset classes. Um, and then secondly, um, excess spread is uh, used as subordination. So that means there are diversion tests that exist that direct excess spread from the more support that would otherwise be paid to more subordinated tranches to the senior tranche as a trade-off for achieving more leverage. So uh, one of those examples is a, uh, is a par over collateralization test. So that is um, uh, if the par drops below a certain ratio, then the uh, a diversion might occur. Uh, and then there's also typically an interest coverage test. So if interest, available interest drops below certain defined levels, then there might be you know, additional cash flow diversions. The, the effect in total of the um, diversion of excess spread is, you know, usually um, potentially like a, a rating uh, notch or two. Um, so the the general analysis of the portfolio and how it revolves in and of itself really is the fundamental credit risk that folks are, are analyzing or that we analyze. And then the additional uh uh, protection and credit risk that's introduced with the uh, OC and the IC tests uh, is a is a secondary analysis. And then Stephanie, maybe from there, um, how do how do all of these elements come together within the CLO? The the asset manager is kind of a, a critical uh, element here, and the asset manager is really doing two very important jobs for the CLO typically. So usually they are the lender that is uh, originating the underlying assets in a middle market CLO. So they are um, originating the assets, which could be you know, a relatively labor intensive process to identify lending opportunities with mid-sized companies. And then they're also managing the CLO. So they are um, working to maintain the eligibility, the um, concentration limits and the uh, other um, collateral quality tests that are associated with uh, the requirements that investors and rating agencies look for within the uh, within the CLO structure. So there's really two very different skills there, um, uh, but they're very important to be working in conjunction with one another in order to have a, a, a functioning CLO. The CLO SPV, like any other structured finance transaction, the purpose of that is to isolate the assets so that the, the credit risk that the investors and rating agencies are analyzing uh, is limited to the portfolio of assets. Um, and to the extent there are ancillary counterparty risks, et cetera, those can be analyzed, but to really kind of isolate those assets for analysis. And then the third real uh, important element of the, the CLO is the, uh, the trustees and the custodians who are associated with it. So those are the, uh, the entities that hold the assets in trust for the benefit of the um, CLO note holders. Thank you, Jerry. Now, now that we've covered the, the very basics of middle market CLOs, walking through the definition, asset composition, and structure, let's focus next on distinctions that you think are important for investors to know, especially regarding how middle market CLOs differ from BSLs. Yeah, yeah sure. So maybe we can start with the obvious, which is a, a borrower size. And uh, while this might be obvious, it sort of drives uh, everything else here. So uh, borrower sizes in middle market CLOs are, are typically less than 100 million in EBITDA annually, uh, although most credits are even uh, within 50 million EBITDA. Um, the borrower size is driving credit quality. So um, typically, those credits um, have lower credit ratings than uh, than broadly syndicated loan CLOs. They might have um, uh, smaller uh, customer bases, more concentrated customer bases. Um, they might have 
more emerging business plans than larger companies, um, and they might have uh, more risky cash flows associated with their uh, with their business. So as a result, we tend to see borrowers that are in the B low and triple C high range more than we might see in BSL CLOs. In fact, for the types of deals that we look at, we see about two thirds of portfolios tend to be in the B low category. And, and frankly, up to a third of some of these portfolios could be in the in the triple C category. Now, given the, the borrowers uh, are smaller, despite the lower uh, credit quality, they tend to have more robust covenants. So there can be protections in default for borrowers um, uh, in the event of uh, default. Um, but for more established, uh, or sorry, less established companies, there can still be risk associated with um, uh, with losses, even given those uh, robust covenants and those robust relationships that borrowers and lenders um, have in the middle market space. Uh, and lastly, at least with regard to credit quality, the, the lack of ratings means that there are more um, credit estimates uh, in the underlying portfolio. So those credit estimates, like we had discussed before, they're less uh, publicly available typically. So there can be lower transparency into those underlying credits than you might see in other, um, in other BSL CLOs. Um, and like I said, DBRS does permit uh, those credit estimates to be shared with uh, investors um, if, uh, if needed. And, and Jerry, what about at the portfolio level? What is DBRS Morningstar seeing there in respects to spreads, diversity, and leverage? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, typically, these portfolios have wider spreads, reflecting the um, you know the higher risk associated with uh, smaller borrowers. Uh, the underlying loans can have um, LIBOR plus four hundred to five hundred um, type spreads. They can actually also be much much wider. Um, we tend to see in some types of CLOs a greater variety of the types of loans that might be included in a, in a middle market CLO. Um, and these, uh, the loans tend to almost always be uh, floating rate loans, uh, similar to uh, BSL CLOs. And these wider uh, loan spreads tend to mean that there is um, wider excess spread available in the transaction. So that means that the uh, the net difference between the, the funding uh, rates and the underlying asset um, uh, you know, underlying asset interest uh, would be wider. So the impact of uh, of uh, diversion tests on middle market CLOs uh, can be more impactful than uh, what you might see in a BSL CLO, potentially. The um, the portfolio um, the portfolios here are also less diverse. So it's much more labor intensive to originate and and frankly monitor uh, the you know these types of assets in the portfolio, and you really want a lender focused on uh, on the uh, on the monitoring for the underlying loans so that lower uh, diversity typically means that we'll see kind of like diversities for middle market silos in the uh, in the 30 to maybe 40 range where you might see uh, up into the 50s and 60s uh, with bsl silos and lastly all of these elements the borrower size the credit quality the spread and the diversity generally means that the leverage embedded within middle market CLOs is lower than you would see within um, uh, in middle market CLOs is lower than in, in BSL CLOs. Uh, so for example, the amount of subordination typically to a, a AAA within a middle market CLO might be in the low to mid 40s. And for BSL CLOs, uh, it's kind of mid 30s ish to, um, uh, to a AAA. Great, thanks, Jerry. This concludes our prepared remarks for the Middle Market CLO 101 webinar. Now we will open up the discussion for Q&A. Again, you will see a question mark on either the right side or bottom of your panel, which you can click on and type out your question. I think I saw a couple come through, but let's give folks a few more minutes to, to get additional questions in. All right, as folks type in, I see one came in. Jerry, how does DBRS Morningstar incorporate ESG into its rating analysis for middle market? Yeah, sure. So the uh, incorporating ESG into CLOs, the way I think about it, is um, uh, largely a derivative activity. So the underlying 
loans themselves would be exposed potentially to a variety of ESG risk. And the act of accumulating them together in and of itself doesn't necessarily alter the uh, ESG risk embedded in the underlying assets. Rather, the CLO is an aggregation of those. So I think about it from typical CLOs, the, the ESG uh, analysis is largely one of understanding and reporting what the underlying risk is in, uh, in diverse corporate portfolios. In fact, if the underlying portfolios themselves have public ratings, DBRS and all of the other rating agencies uh, incorporate ESG into their analysis. So if there are impacts on the ultimate default probability for borrowers, uh, th that is that is incorporated to the extent that there are uh, there are public or private ratings. In middle market CLOs, though, there are this larger percentage of borrowers that don't have ratings. So those borrowers might need an additional step if they are credit estimated. There might be additional analysis that uh, we might need to conduct in conjunction with our corporate team on whether there are elements that we need to um, adjust the default probabilities for those uh, unrated assets. And then that just connects right back to the, the fundamental point I made first, which is um, then, the, then the, 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 the most sort of rational uh, element for investors is describing what and where the ESG risk might be in an underlying portfolio uh, and reporting that. Great. Let me see, we have a few more that just came through. Let me filter through some of them. I think this one sounds like a good one. Can you speak to the warehousing process and seasoning process where there are foreign investors in the CLO debt slash equity? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So for middle market CLOs, um, because of the lender's more intense origination um, origination involvement with the loans, there's usually a multiple step seasoning process with loans um, that are originated into an SPV. So that could have a, a different impact on um, foreign, uh, non-US or US uh, investors. So I'll admit that I don't um, as a credit analyst, have all of the answers of what those implications would be, um, except to say that there are usually multiple steps of assets being originated into particular um, seasoning vehicles uh, before they were added to CLOs to really, uh, to really avoid the characterization that the CLO is uh, a U.S. trader business. Um, the the intent for the, the intent for collateral managers for CLOs is really to create um, asset accumulation vehicles, not to uh, set up a, a, a lending bank. So those various uh, steps and asset sales are intended to um, assist with that process. Great. We have a few more in here. Earlier, you mentioned uh, credit estimates. Can you please discuss the process for what a credit estimate uh, goes through? Yeah, sure. A, a credit estimate um, for DBRS is a, a model-driven uh, default probability. So uh, we ask uh, lenders to submit uh, audited financial statements for the underlying borrowers. Um, we also find it's useful to see credit memos for underlying borrowers, not because we're interested in the um, in the opinion of the underlying lender necessarily, but it often organizes the information around a corporate in a very digestible way um, capital structure uh, it's uh, it, it's market uh, uh, it's market penetration it's customer base uh, etc and credit estimates typically take uh, maybe a day or two to uh, to complete for clients so we can usually uh, move through larger portfolios in a relatively speedy way great thank you we have a few more in here let's see. How do U.S.-based managers satisfy risk retention if their funds are holding the equity? So it, it is um, it is a requirement for many CLO managers uh, or CLO, middle market CLOs to satisfy risk retention. 
So broadly syndicated CLOs tend to fall within a category um, with, the, uh, with the syndicated underlying assets and the distributed equity. Uh, they tend to fall out of risk retention requirements, uh, but many middle market CLOs tend to fall into that, um, into that category. So there are many lawyers who can advise on how best to do that. But I will say as a credit analyst for CLOs, we do observe that there that often for middle market CLOs, there is a uh, there is a risk retention requirement that needs to be satisfied. Okay. So let me filter through a couple more. Hold on. What threats and or regulations do you see that could change the CLO market? I think there are some um, there are some regulations actually now or proposed regulations in the U.S. Um, that could reinstitute risk retention for uh, and I think that that would largely impact more uh, BSL CLOs. So that is um, that is a proposal that is uh, being brought up in the uh, in in Congress in the U.S. So I think that that could potentially change the landscape for CLOs. Um, I do think CLOs continue to maintain this um, this vigilance from regulators, given the CDO structures from uh, 2008 and 2009 and 10, and their consequences. So. Uh, there are uh, certainly pieces that are uh, digestible from uh, from ESMA. I know the NAIC has uh, primers and opinions on CLOs. So I think folks are you know constantly looking at the CLO space, and I think that that's good for the CLO industry to have those eyes looking at uh, looking at CLOs. So there could always be changes or um, or, or pivots in regulation because of things that those uh, regulatory entities uh, see over time. Um, but I think in the short term, um, for me, it's the it's the regulations that are proposed uh, now currently in Congress uh, having to do with uh, risk retention. Great, thank you. Let's see, and are then, middle market CLOs primarily only in the U.S. or is there also a market in Europe? Yeah, so um, they are primarily in the U.S. Um, there are a small handful of what I would call traditional middle market CLOs in Europe. So those are um, non-granular portfolios. But I think you, you actually see the, the middle and the smaller end of uh, corporate loan securitization in Europe uh, in uh, SME or small to medium-sized enterprise CLOs. So the lending market for the smaller end of the uh, mid-sized borrowers is still very much a bank lending market. Um, for middle mid-sized borrowers, there has been a pr proliferation over the last four to five years of direct lending funds in Europe. And those have sought some leverage, but they've, they've not yet really tapped into the CLO market. They tend to uh, obtain um, uh, private leverage there, either from, uh, uh, from banks or from small syndicate relationships. Thank you, Jerry. I think we have addressed all the questions posed. Do you have any other closing comments that you wanted to make, Jerry? Yeah, I'm just seeing one last question pop in. Oh, here one just popped in. Oh, on the, okay. But I'll, I'll address it actually. And is there software available for analyzing this? Ah. And the short answer of that is uh, yes, we do have a publicly available CELO asset model. Uh, and the the purpose of that is to um, is to arrive at a stress portfolio default rate, which is one of the key inputs to the remainder of the CLO analysis. So uh, that's available on ebrs.com. Excellent. Okay, now I believe we have addressed all of the questions posed. We want to thank uh, each of you for taking time out of your day to join us. And thank you to you, Jerry, for spending your afternoon with us. We hope that everyone found our Middle Market CLO 101 session helpful. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for playback should you wish to revisit any discussion points or perhaps share the replay with your colleagues. And as a reminder, part two of this 101 will take place on December 2nd at the same time, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where we will delve further into CLO warehouses, 
and other bespoke CLO-like financings. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope to see you at the next session in a couple weeks. <laughs>